Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This is um, Microsoft Research Connections, and um, this is the group that works with universities worldwide, uh, and we work on a variety of projects in computer science, but also in, in science and education. So uh, the three areas we work in, collaborations on science using computer science, uh, producing tools that can help uh, accelerate progress for science, and I'll give some examples. But above all, what we'd like to do is excite and inspire uh, a very important community for Microsoft, uh, which is computer scientists, information scientists. Okay, uh, thank you. So this is the, the way the group is organized. We have five themes. Uh, Two of them are scientific, that's earth, energy, and environment, and uh, health and well-being, and I won't be talking very much about them today, nor about education and scholarly communication, which is, if you like, the information science and engineering community. So I want to focus mainly on core computer science uh, activities, and you'll hear talks about natural user interface at this conference. So we produced some... Uh, research accelerators. Uh, we have global partnerships uh, in, in all parts of the world. So we have uh, in Europe, we have, a, for example, a collaborative center with INRIA, a major computer science research center in France. Uh, and also in Asia, we have uh, joint labs with many of the major universities in the region. Uh, in Latin America, we collaborate with FAPESPI in Brazil, and we have a joint institute and fund projects in Brazil. But uh, in Latin America generally, we have LAXIA, and you'll hear about our projects with the, the LAXIA Federation of, of, of Universities. So those are some of the things we do. The, the other things are on external researchers. We have a uh, sponsor an ACM student research competition. We have internships, as you know, in Microsoft. Uh, we also give a Jim Gray eScience Award and graduate women scholars. But what I'd like to do today is announce, we've just announced today, our new faculty fellows. These are fellowships that we give to faculty who've been in position in universities for less than three years, and it's meant to give them a boost uh, in their career and, and funds to do their research and travel and attend conferences, fund students, and so on. So uh, um, it's a very competitive field. We, I'm constantly astounded each year how, how, how good the candidates are and how, how smart they are. And I'm very pleased to announce that uh, our Latin American fellow uh, today is with us. Uh, uh, his research topics are helping computers and robots see the world. So he's working on algorithms for automatic recognition and understanding of, of, of images and videos and so on, and human motions and activity. Uh, his name is Juan Carlos Niebles from the University del Norte in Barranquilla, Colombia. And uh, could you... Uh, please stand up, uh, Juan Carlos. <laughs> Congratulations and many thanks uh, for your participation today. So, uh, one of the things we've been doing is amplifying some of the research in our labs, and you've heard some talks about machine translation, some words about that. And what we've been developing with the machine translation team in Microsoft Research is, if you like, a crowdsourcing of machine translation. And so Microsoft Translator Hub is helping smaller language thrive by giving the power to build machine translation systems in the hands of local communities. So if you like, if you're worried about your language for your particular, for example, take Welsh in the UK, it's a small language and not, not many people speak it, not many millions, it's never going to be commercially important, but it's very important if you're Welsh. And so that's a, an example of, 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 of the sort of languages that can be helped. And uh, Kristen Tull from our group is talking about MT Hub tomorrow. And what I'd like to do now is, is, is talk a little bit 
introduce a demo. We're going to show you ChronoZoom, which is one of the tools for examining and, and displaying big data. Both these MT Hub and ChronoZoom use Azure, and this will tell you how you can actually capture uh, over 13 billion years of history in the same canvas and put all sorts of data. So, Mike, off you go. I'm going to go pretty quickly. If the guys upstairs could uh, switch back over to this machine, please. There we go. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm here today to talk to you about ChronoZoom. Uh, this is the history of everything. It's a uh, HTML5 canvas that runs on uh, all sorts of web browsers, on all sorts of platforms, and it's a collaborative effort between Microsoft Research, uh, uh, University of California at Berkeley, and Moscow State University in Moscow, Russia. And it's an open source project. The code is freely available. And uh, it's an interactive dynamic timeline for exploring uh, historical events and telling stories through all of time. So what you see here today is um, a time scale at the top that goes from today on your right over to 14.7 billion years ago on your left where uh, the world began or you know, time began with the Big Bang. And the entire canvas is clickable and zoomable, and you'll see this timeline scale as I zoom in and out and show different aspects of history. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll start with is um, the, uh, the creation of the stars. This is threshold two, one of the thresholds at which exponential um, changes in the complexity of the universe allowed new things to happen. And then here's the Big Bang. So in this timeline and in these exhibits, not only can you have uh, interactive media and big data mashups of multimedia elements, uh, but you can um, incorporate these things into... Uh, no, my, my name is Sergey. I'm a third year biology student at the University of California, 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 California Berkeley. California, Berkeley. I've been working on a timeline about the evolution of life as a big mistake. Let's try that again. <laughs> the demo gods are not with us today. Okay, so anyway, this gives you an idea of, of how ChronoZoom works. Um, but I'm really excited to announce today the launching of a content update to ChronoZoom Beta. This, we just released a new set of content for this platform, uh, specifically for the Latin America Summit. And I'm going to quickly play a tour. Um, this is one of the ways that we're exposing stories and historical elements throughout all of time. And we worked with um, Felipe... Uh, Gaitan and Carmina uh, Murillo from the La Salle University in Mexico City uh, to create a Mayan history timeline. Hi, my name is Carmina Murillo. I'm responsible for academic relations of postgraduate studies and research at La Salle University, Mexico. We have made a study of the Mayan culture mainly divided in five periods and focused in the social aspect of this civilization. That's why we indicate the Mayan preclassical period as a way to understand the starting point of what in its moment was known as the Empire of Kukulcan, the narrative of the Popo Vuh, the mathematical invention of the Zuro, and the cosmic calendar whose precision describes almost perfectly the cycles of movement of the Earth. So I'm going to pause the, the tour there, and I'm just going to start exploring ChronoZoom. I think you saw that um, two billion year per second journey we just took into a nanopixel resolution uh, that got us into the Mayan timeline from the cosmos. So uh, if I want to freely explore one of these exhibits inside the, um, inside the ChronoZoom canvas, you can see here there's some rich detail describing the, uh, the beautiful elements of the Mayan calendar. There are supporting artifacts here. Um, to tell you more about the detail of, of the different glyphs that are used inside the Mayan calendar. And we can even uh, reference uh, other uh, experts in the field to help tell the story. Again, this is all happening inside um, the ChronoZoom canvas. Gradually, first... Having fun. Okay, so uh, we must have had a network hiccup here. Gentlemen worked out how the Maya marked time, a system now called the calendar round. 
The calendar round is made up of three interlocking cycles, a 365-day solar year, a cycle of 20 names, and a cycle of 13 numbers. Days are designated by the way these three cycles line up. For so example, tells, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and pause it here. We're obviously having some network issues, but the point I wanted to make is that there's all sorts of rich detail and rich information inside ChronoZoom that tell all about the Mayan culture. Uh, this is specifically this part of the timeline is describing the pre-classic period. And if I uh, come out and, and show the whole timeline here from about uh, 800 BC to about 1700 AD, uh, you can see that it's, it's broken up into various uh, periods. Now the classic period was the, the time of Mayan history where it was at its fullest, the richest, where all the cultures of these various tribes came together, their language was consumed, they, uh, they formed um, strong kingdoms, and, uh, and here's a, an exhibit that talks about um, their writing order and how they had a language, a common language that came together and how that worked, and you can learn more about the, the language constructs in, here, in this exhibit. Um, the, uh, the ball games are something that are also very popular with tourists and, and very interesting and there's some great artifacts in, in local, uh, local areas around, around this area which are, is pretty exciting. Um, what we see here is a mashup with uh, some photosynth data inside ChronoZoom that allows you to have a virtual 3D tour of the ruins of, of Chichen Itza and the, uh, the ball game court. And you can also um, embed all sorts of other images inside here and uh, really just continue exploring and zooming into this canvas in all sorts of different ways to help explore um, stories and, and rich information. And so finally, um, you know, the post-classic post era, uh, there was, at the beginning of this era, uh, there was a lot done around um, observatories, there, the stars and the alignments and how the calendar and the gods and the sacrifices that had to occur in the Mayan culture to help them uh, continue to uh, survive. Uh, eventually, you know, there's, there's uh, stories about droughts and, um, and, and infighting between tribes that ended up um, causing the Mayan culture to ultimately um, decline. And the Spaniards came in and, and then um, kind of took over. So, so this is really exciting, I think, for uh, the project and for Microsoft as well as um, Latin America region. And um, I'd encourage you to go to chronozoomproject.org and um, give us your feedback because this is a beta and uh, we're very much interested in collaborating further. It's uh, again uh, built by the community for the community. We're really just facilitating the effort. And uh, I'll let us take a journey back up um, to all of time and uh, give us an idea of how small in the history of everything we really are. Um, I'll be presenting this again at DemoFest on Friday. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you're free to come by and see me then. So thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. If you could switch the slides back, please. Great. OK, so this is just uh, for information. Microsoft supports uh, an open source uh, foundation called the Outer Curve Foundation. And the Microsoft Research Connections runs what's called a gallery. And it's a gallery for research accelerators. And in there, you'll find the, the source of ChronoZoom. And you can uh, take it and, and play with it yourselves. So uh, we invite you to, uh, to join. Um, what I want to talk about in this talk, however, is not those topics. I'd like to talk instead about uh, computer science research at Microsoft. And uh, we've had great collaborations with the uh, Software Engineering Research Group in Microsoft Research in Redmond. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about their work uh, and some of the things we're doing. So this is a, a program that Judith Bishop and her team in computer science run. She'll be talking tomorrow about how software engineering is the best career for anybody. All right? You can agree or disagree with her tomorrow. Uh, uh, this is a program we've been running since 2009, and uh, as you see, uh, it's about time Mexico got on this list, all right? So uh, I invite you to uh, apply uh, if you're from anywhere in Latin America and, and, and get one of these grants. So um, 
what I'd like to talk about uh, are Microsoft secrets, right? So there's a book that uh, was published around 1998 called Microsoft Secrets. What was that about? Well, it was about the software engineering challenges faced by Microsoft. Now, I came from a university, and I was used to writing software with a couple of grad students, postdocs, small teams. Uh, and that was certainly the approach that was possible in the 1970s and 80s, and things like DOS, Word, and Excel were written by really small teams. Uh, unfortunately, software programs get more complicated, more complex. It's not just Microsoft, it's in the whole world. Everything gets uh, bigger uh, and, and complex. And the uh, number of people grew to hundreds, and we're now into thousands. Uh, and the lines of code grew from uh, hundreds of thousands of lines to millions of lines. And how do you coordinate and how do you write and test programs of that scale? So that's what I want to talk about. It's big scale programming and software engineering. And uh, what the book Microsoft Secrets talks about is how Microsoft deals with that. Uh, as you know, Microsoft likes to hire really smart people. And so uh, what we wanted to attempt to build was a process that allows large teams to work like small teams. And you can do that by allowing large teams to work in parallel on different things, but you have to bring it back together. And that's this synchronize and stabilize approach. And so you have these synchronization product builds, milestone stabilizations, and continual testing. So you go from working code to working code, and that's really uh, part of the process in Microsoft. So I'd like to tell you some of the um, uh, that's what I wanted. OK. So this just gives you some of the scale. All right. Uh, so in Windows NT, 200 developers, testers were about 140, uh, nearly 5 million lines of code. By the time you get to Windows 2000, you have thousands of developers and testers, and you're now up to nearly 30 million lines of code. And that's something that is difficult to conceive of doing in a university, but this is the sort of problems that any big software project fa uh, faces, and in particular Microsoft with its software. And as you can see, uh, the, I've only gone up to, to Windows XP, but now we have thousands of programmers and uh, 40 million lines of code, and it's more now. So that gives you some idea of the scale of the problem. So software engineering. There was a study by the US uh, National Standards Body, NIST, estimated that software bugs were costing the US, US economy more than $60 billion per year, and that programmers were spending most of their time fixing bugs than instead of writing new code. So what Microsoft's philosophy has been Software tools, not only to find bugs before the software is released, as you're writing it to make it better and, and more efficient, to make it a more engineering discipline, if you like, but also to analyze the errors when they're reported. What you do with all the bug reports, what you do with all the error messages that you get, how do you decide which bugs should you fix, which ones are important. So the goal of this is summarized by using software to make software better. And that's really what the RISE group do. So, uh, again, in 2008, a survey uh, of Accenture did of, of U.S. program managers saying that 40% of the decisions are not based on fact but on, on, the, on the manager's instincts. And so what the software engineering group are trying to do is, is actually gain insight from the data to enable the software teams to make better decisions. So actually looking at the processes, looking at actually what's done in developing software, how could you make the decisions better uh, so you get, ge generate better code, less bugs, more efficient. And obviously Microsoft have a large number of code bases for which to try these tools out. So this is something that Microsoft Research does which doesn't necessarily get into the outside world, although some of the, the tools do, do, but nonetheless is, is absolutely vital in, in, in dealing with huge projects of this scale. So uh, what I want to talk then is about uh, one of the groups in the uh, research and software engineering team called the Empirical Software Engineering Group, who look at three types of challenges, and I'll briefly touch on all of them. Um, 
I'll start with uh, looking at the data, data-driven software engineering. What can you learn from previous projects? What can you learn as the project goes on to make the software better and to make it more efficient about doing it? How do you measure efficiency and so on? Uh, whoops. And then I want, sorry, I pressed the wrong button, apologize. I wanted to talk about when you get the bugs, what do you do with them, and who, who fixes them. And then who fixes them may not be the same people who wrote the code, so they have to, uh, there are all sorts of challenges there, which is what I mean by the socio-technical challenges here. So let's then start with the data-driven software engineering aspects. And if I go there, uh, what one does to make large teams work like small teams, you get the teams to work on different parts of the code simultaneously. So you try and get uh, uh, branches in the source control where you have a parent and then these two teams can work independently but you have to integrate, you do edits and then you integrate again. And so this is the process. You isolate work so that these teams can work together at the same time. Uh, but then you have to bring it back together. So these branch convergences are a, 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 an issue. And you can just see that from the next slide, which shows just the code flow for a single file. And if you see here, the integration are all these yellow dots. And you can see it's a huge amount of effort to bring these branches back together. And in this case, uh, the code velocity, that the, the speed at which you incorporate edits and really make progress on building what you're trying to build is particularly slow in this case. So can you do better than this? Well, first of all, you need to know you have this problem. So mining your data to find out what problems you have is absolutely vital. So how do you coordinate parallel development and how do you make the branches more effective, more efficient? How, how do you reduce the complexity? And that's what the, the empirical software engineering team do. And they do it by, sorry, by looking at surveying the de developers to understand what their problems are with the branching, so finding out what, the, what they actually think their problems are, mining the development data uh, for the relationship of the various teams and the branches. Are they in the same place? Are they the same team are working on the same parts of the code? And then you can simulate uh, the costs and benefits. You can actually rerun the writing of a piece of code and see could you have made it more efficient. And so the actions that come out of all this analysis are uh, 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 you can alert users about possible conflicts where there are likely to be problems. You can recommend uh, making a smaller branch structure or adding things and deleting things. Uh, and you can even attempt to do semi-automatic branch refactoring. So um, the next slide uh, is meant to show you uh, the difference between Windows Vista here and Windows 7. And so this is on the bottom you have file similarity, how similar are the files. This is low file similarity, this is high. Up the side you have developers. Are they the same developers? Are they a different developer team? And what you see from that is that most pairs of branches are not similar down in this quadrant here. So this is not very similar files down here and not very similar developers. You can go up. Uh, you have the same developers but working on different things is perfectly okay. And over here, you see here, you have the same files, high file similarity, the same people. So same files should mean the same people because then you get less problems because it's the same people, same teams working on them. And finally, down here, you have um, same files, but different teams means you're liable to get problems. And so what you see from this slide is that uh, you really want to populate this area more because same files, same people is not going to cause problems. And so you can see the major change here is that pe people have been moved from here to here. And actually, you can actually go and measure the number of bugs at the same time of development in Vista and in Windows 7. And I'm pleased to tell you, Windows 7 is 
easier and better code than Windows Vista was at the same stage of development. So and you can analyze that here, and in fact you can do uh, different things. You can replay the history of the code because you've got all these records. You can uh, try and cost the average delay increase per edit. You can cost the integrations of edit on a branch, and you can find the benefit provided by isolating. So can you do more work by having a branch? And if you do that, you can get this sort of data. So you can actually look at all the branches, and you can plot it against the isolation, that's the benefit that more people can work on it, versus the delay caused by bringing them together. And uh, this is the cost, and this is the benefit, and what you'd like to get is, is high benefit for low cost. And you see these red dots are giving you very little benefit, and they give you a fair amount of cost. So uh, if the high cost, low benefit had been removed, uh, it would have saved you several days of work and actually only introduced a very small amount of additional conflicts. So you can do that sort of analysis and help the dev teams actually think more carefully about the branching structure. So, summary. By doing branch analytics, you can actually try and bring a, a real discipline to the way you write these big codes. Uh, they can improve the code velocity, they can actually help you define the structure, they can help you with scheduling, and they can build you reliable systems with low conflicts. So that's the benefits by doing this branch analytics, which is, if you like, data mining on our own uh, development data. When the software is out there, you get bugs reported. And one of the problems, which is, again, not perhaps obvious, is that you get the bug and you say, well, who's going to fix this? And you decide which, which bugs you're going to fix and then you hand them to somebody. But one of the problems is that, um, for example, in Mozilla and Eclipse, between around 40% of the bug reports are given to somebody who then says, well, this isn't me who should fix this, and they throw it off to another developer. And that goes on, another developer. So you get this, this, this bug fix gets tossed from developer to developer, and delays get in the system. So can you actually reduce the amount of time that uh, you, you get the, the, the bug fix to the right people, the right team to go fix it, without having to have multiple uh, assignments taking time, and it sometimes goes back and forth between different people. So that's um, what Microsoft Research Empirical Engineering have been able to do. They've reduced the, the time that bug reports get tossed around by up to 70%. And so you can make benefits in, in, in how you actually deal with the bug reports when the code is actually out there. And finally, bug fixing. Well, our codes are maintained and evolved by programmers who didn't actually write it. So the testers, for example, in China, India, or wherever, all over the world, don't have the same background knowledge or, or the memory of how the code was written. So how do you actually, um, how do they get enough knowledge to fix the bug? And how do they actually understand enough of the code not to introduce more bugs? And so there are all sorts of issues here. Uh, do you keep them in the same team? Are, are, are they face-to-face, -face, communication, knowledge management? All these sort of issues that come in, and actually studying and understanding them is really clearly beneficial. So this is just looking at what the uh, team in India do. What, what, how do they get information to satisfy, to fix the bug? And they do it from a variety of, of things. They look up in a library, they use existing knowledge, they ask colleagues, they ask colleagues in Redmond, and so on. So you can analyze exactly where the knowledge comes from, and with that knowledge you can actually do something about it. So that's empirical software engineering, and I think it doesn't sound enormously exciting, but I think it really is a very exciting type of data mining which actually is necessary to, do, to build these huge software packages. So the next thing is different. This is the, uh, the quotation from Bill Gates that Peter used in his talk uh, this morning. So uh, actually building a tool which can use theory to check whether uh, something about a program is correct. And what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about this. Uh, it, it's model checking in action, if you like. So, so the application 
that was chosen were device drivers. Now, device drivers were chosen specifically because they're a, a, a very important application. The device drivers aren't written necessarily by Microsoft, but because they interact very low level with the operating system, they can cause crashes. Many of the crashes you see in Windows that are blamed on Microsoft actually came from the device driver, which we didn't write. So it can have very severe effects, and it really is something we need to educate people to write correctly. And so the code is usually relatively small, and there are protocols of how the device should interact with the operating system. And the question is, are the drivers that people are building respecting the correct protocol? Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Uh, and uh, this is an example of a, a, a finite state machine. This is a, uh, you acquire a hold, when the hold is here, you can't acquire another one. If you do, it's an error, and so on. So this is a very simple example of, of a finite state protocol where you can see that there's an error. And uh, what it turns out is that the, the correctness of these programs, usually in something like C, depends mostly on the control flow. So what the team uh, developed some years ago was a tool called SLAM, which uses this trick of called predicate abstraction and refinement. So what that does, it takes a C program here, uh, removes the actual, most of the variables and, and, and replaces them, for example, x greater than y, it can be produced by a logical uh, Boolean, and, and the, the control structures it can replace by Booleans, and so you get what's called a Boolean version of this C program, which you can then run through the model checker, and you can see whether it actually uh, satisfies the API. You can check against the API, and you can sometimes say it's correct. If it doesn't come out as correct, you're not sure that it, it's, it's, it's wrong. It may, not, may or may not be a bug, so you produce uh, an abstract trace, which you can then make into something that you can actually see if the program can really get there. And so sometimes you can say d immediately that uh, this, this trace is a bug, and you get an error message, and you found an error in your driver. Often, however, you can't, and you send it uh, around, and you do another refinement of the predicates, and run the loop again, and again, and so on. And usually, although there's no guarantee that the thing will terminate, most times it terminates and gives you uh, error messages or correctness. So it's a, a very useful tool, and it's particularly useful when you uh, writing uh, drivers, uh, you, most driver uh, writers use the sample codes that Microsoft supplies. Uh, and if there's an error in the sample code, it will, of course, affect many other uh, people who use it. They will just produce the same code. So this tool, SLAM, is now uh, in the, what's called the Static Driver Verifier, SDV, in the, in the Windows Development Kit, Driver Kit, and uh, what it is applied regularly to the device drivers of all supported models, sorry, uh, and uh, has found bugs in the samples, which is extremely important because people then write drivers with bugs in, uh, and it's now available for third parties to use. So this is a tool that's come from really from theory, and it's actually now is, is in the real world doing useful things. And what it does, it relies uh, at its lowest level on a tool called um, Z3, or Z3 in English, uh, SMT Theorem Prover, which is a collection of, of these uh, symbolic reasoning engines here, which uh, you can read here. Uh, and uh, this is a very powerful tool and has been used by uh, many, many research groups around the world. We release it free for academic use, so you can download it and, uh, and, and use it. Uh, it's also won various competitions in this verification community. And, uh, uh, for example, the SAGE tool, which is fuzzing code for testing, it's been used by Win8 and Office, uh, it ships, it's used with the SDV I just talked about, and it's also 
used to check the Azure firewall policies. So it's widely used within Microsoft. It's also available as, as, as a download for the community. And uh, on that, you can build many things. And so what I'd like to do uh, is uh, talk about, get a demonstration of, of using uh, Z3 and this kernel software, Boogie, uh, in, in one of these applications. So the application that uh, uh, we're talking about now is by Rustin Lino, who's going to come up and demo uh, a tool called Daphne, which is uh, a program verifier. So it, 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 it advances the state of the art. At the moment, it's used in teaching. Um, and you can go and use it yourself on the Rise for Fun website. And it was used by um, teams in the VSTTE competition that I talked about earlier. So I'd like to ask Rustan to come and uh, do a demo. Thank you very much. All right. So um, I need your help, Mike. All right. So Daphne is a program verifier. It can uh, get to the point where you can mathematically verify the correctness of your program, that is, to make sure that there are no bugs for the sorts of things that you're checking for. So Daphne is a language by itself. It's quite similar to C Sharp or to, to Java or to C. And thank you. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a small demo of the, of the program verifier that is, that is included with, with Daphne. So Daphne, just like you would have a, a type checker run in the background, typically when you develop in Visual Studio. In Daphne, you instead get the, or in, you get in addition, the program verifier. What I'm going to do, though, is demo it not in Visual Studio, um, which I'll do tomorrow during my lecture. But instead, I'll just show you this uh, interface on the web that you can go to on Rise for Fun. So here I'm showing you a small um, portion of a, of a Daphne program. It's a class that implements a ring buffer, which is really just a, a queue. And the queue is, is specified to have some contents that you can see here, well, if you have good eyes, um, and it has some capacity. And it's implemented in terms of some, uh, some variables, like an array and so forth. And the, um, the operations are what you would expect. There's a constructor that, could, that creates it, and there are various methods for dequeuing and enqueuing um, elements into this ring buffer. Now, there's a complicated data structure in between um, that's being used, uh, complicated in the sense that the, the buffer is used in a, in a ring. That is, you're, you're enqueuing on one end, you're dequeuing from the other, and whenever you get to the end of the buffer, you wrap around, just like you would in, um, uh, if you're writing this yourself using an array. That data structure is described using, using the invariant that you see here. Um, it's not important that you see the details, but you describe the, the the invariant, the things that always hold of the data structure when it's in a steady state. And that's very important when you try to reason about the correctness. So let me just point to one part in the end queue where, uh, where I've inserted a, um, an error. Uh, let's see if I can scroll here. The, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Daphne uh, to verify this program for me. So at this point, again, it would, Daphne would run in the background if you were using Visual Studio. Here I'm using the, the web interface, so I click the button, and it's complaining about a, an index out of range in this uh, line of code. So it says that the next empty might not be in range of the, of the array called data. Well, uh, at this point, we would go through the code and we'd figure out what it is. And since I've already done that, let me just go ahead and fix it, uh, even though the process for figuring out um, where the error is is interesting by itself. In this case, the, um, the code was trying to double the buffer if there was no more size, if there was no more capacity in it. But if you double a buffer that is of zero size, you're not getting anything that's actually bigger. So that was the problem here. That is, this, this is the sort of thing that, that if you do testing, you really would have had to have something that's calling it with, with a zero length, that, to create a zero length um, ring buffer to begin with if you were to find it. OK, so then I have written the code here, and I asked Daphne again. And you can see here that it verified the code for me. So this is the sort of thing that, that Daphne can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. If we could switch back to the other ones. Thank you very much. So that just shows you that um, 
besides doing APIs, we're now actually moving on to doing real code, and uh, I think it's really exciting, and uh, we're uh, very pleased to be working with the, uh, the RISE team. And so this is, I think, a round of applause for our the software engineering researchers. So, so uh, they'll be talking about their work at this conference, and Judith will be talking tomorrow, so I do uh, suggest you go and talk to them and find out for real what's going on under the covers. And if you're interested, uh, a career in software engineering is obviously uh, worthwhile. And so the last slide is then, what's the future of software engineering? Well, what I've to show you that empirical software engineering leads to sort of software analytics, which enables you to make decisions based on data, not on what your instinct tells you, and it tells you what process you have and what practice to use. And so I think that has great prospects for making software engineering a, 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 a more reliable and more predictable process, and I think that's a continuing research problem. Uh, Logic-based tools can help you do better software, and you've seen a demo of, of Daphne, and there are lots of other demos building on top of Z3 and Boogie that you can go and have a look at. And you can build your own tools, because Boogie is available open source, as is Daphne. And uh, as you heard uh, in the previous talk, future pro platforms such as the web, the cloud, mobile devices, all provide new exciting challenges for software engineering. So I do believe that Judith's talk is right, tomorrow that really software engineering is one of the best jobs you can do. So with that, I'd like to end and thank uh, the researchers again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, are there any questions for Tony? I can take some questions if people would like, mm -hmm. but I will be around drinking margaritas after dinner, if you wish. Okay. Okay, Not too many margaritas. Okay, I think the questions will be for the, for the open bar then. Okay, sounds okay. good. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks a lot.